Hello, my name is Hans van der Kwast. I'm a lecturer at IHC Delft Institute for Water Education. In this video I'm going to teach you what GIS is. The learning objectives of this lecture are to define GIS, to give examples of what can be done with GIS, and describe different tools that can be used for GIS, both open source and proprietary software. So what is GIS? GIS consists of three words, geographic, information and system. It's geographic because it deals with spatially referenced data. The acquisition of data, the processing, the manipulation and the analysis are done in geographic space with coordinates. It's also an information system. It deals with software, hardware, a database, where we can integrate, store, edit, analyze, share, and display spatial data. And it comes with applications. We need applications to create interactive queries, to analyze spatial information, edit data in maps, and present the results. So spatial data is in the center of a GIS. This is where the locations are, but only with locations we can't use it. We also need attribute data. The attributes connected to spatial data contain the information. And there's metadata. We need to know things like the units, the projection, and other data that we need to uh, know before we can really use the data. Then there are all kinds of things that are around the spatial data. There's uh, image raster processing, there's database management, there's geospatial analysis, there's geostatistical analysis, cartographic representation, and digitization. And they interact with the spatial data for the creation or as an output. So we can have data from sensors that provide uh, raster images that we use in the GIS. We can have da data from tables, uh, spreadsheets or comma separated files that uh, we can also use or convert to spatial data. We can uh, do statistics or derive statistical reports from the data. Or we can um, digitize maps to get data into GIS or we can get data out of the GIS and print it on a map or use it nowadays in visual products such as interactive websites. The nice thing about the GIS is that there is uh, spatial data that is connected to information, to attributes. So here if we click on a lake on the map, the name of the lake highlights in the attribute table and it gives us the information about the lake. The other way around, if we click on the lake in the list in the attribute table, it will also highlight on the map. Here we see another example of what we can do with the GIS. This is a so-called isochrone map, where we see the travel time from the center of Berlin to the outskirts. Uh, and the total travel time is 30 minutes, but we divide it in circles of five minutes intervals. And in this way, we can see which areas can be reached uh, very fast or have a fast connection to the center and which uh, take longer of course depending on the road conditions. We can also uh, represent data in interactive maps in so-called 2.5D. So 2D are flat maps and uh, 3D is when we need uh, special equipment and 3D glasses. But if we have the shading impression we call it 2.5D. And here we see the Vestra catchment in uh, Belgium. It's a Google satellite image draped over um, the SRTM digital elevation model. And on top of it, we see in blue um, the hydrography from OpenStreetMap. So how did it all start? What was the history of GIS? Well, for GIS we need computers. So before the 1960s, we consider it as the dark ages of GIS, where Maps were made uh, in a traditional way, on paper, and it was a craft. 
Nowadays, of course, it's also a craft, but we are uh, very much depending on computer technology. And that technology started in 1960s up till uh, 1975, when the first pioneers started uh, doing things that we uh, consider now GIS. One of them uh, was Roger Tomlinson, and in that time uh, it was already possible to print uh, graphics using line printers and to store data using um, big mainframe computers and also to record coordinates uh, as a data input. And people like uh, Roger Tomlinson were able to combine uh, this technology into what we call the first uh, GIS nowadays. And it was for the Canadian uh, government and he developed uh, the Canadian Geographic System, CGIS. And um, they invented uh, to use the so-called layer approach, which we still use in GIS, where data uh, is stored in different layers that can be uh, superimposed. And uh, they used this for um, the Canadian land inventory in uh, 1964. Uh, that took until uh, 1971 to become fully operational. And um, at around the same time, in the 70s, it was the uh, US um, Census Bureau who started also uh, with uh, GIS. And there's also an example from the Ordnance Survey in UK who started to uh, develop maps using GIS and different data products. A little further in time, between 1975 and 1990, was the time that um, computers became more and more available. So there uh, was a possibility to commercialize uh, GIS and the first companies started uh, developing uh, software for GIS in the mid 70s. And uh, this is also the time um, that uh, ESRI uh, started. And in uh, 1982, um, ArcInfo was uh, launched. And uh, yeah, that developed until what we have nowadays with uh, ArcGIS and ArcMap. Um, even later in time, between 1990 and 2010, uh, many, many more people started using uh, computers and GIS becomes uh, um, in academia and in governments a tool that is used next to your uh, word processing or a spreadsheet program. And more and more people are uh, able to, uh, to make maps. And this is because, of course, the computers become uh, cheaper and faster and more powerful and uh, more software is available and also the um, digital literacy is increasing. And what's also important is that around this time also a lot of uh, new data becomes available, like data from satellite images. But how does this develop now? Well, today we are not depending on uh, only commercial companies. We also have uh, a lot more choice in uh, software and uh, many tools are open source, which means that we can use them uh, without buying a license and that we are all able to, uh, to contribute to these uh, software products and to combine uh, the different tools and to make new uh, tools, products and services. And that's uh, very important. So we can say that nowadays uh, GIS is a multi-billion dollar industry where uh, the tool is very useful for all kind of uh, spatial planning and decision making and environmental assessments uh, that we need to do uh, with all the challenges that, uh, that we uh, face. So how do we use uh, GIS in the water sector for example? Well, it's an important tool in uh, integrated water resources management. Traditionally, the different departments produce their own data. And uh, it's very important that uh, these different departments, different sectors, uh, reuse the data and um, analyze and combine data of each other to come to uh, solutions that are needed for integrated water resources management. Also for uh, disaster response, spatial data is very important. If there's a crisis or a problem, we need to immediately assess uh, the problem and collect uh, the proper data information and then generate the alternatives and the solutions and uh, have the policy action in place 
and we also need to evaluate the outcome of our uh, uh, measure taken after the disaster. How is GIS used for urban water systems? Well, it's very important to map uh, sewage systems and drainage systems and to plan the wastewater treatment plants. And it's also very important to take care of uh, land use and land use change and uh, relate the infrastructure to those uh, changes. So here in this map we see a uh, water supply network of the Adjumani in Uganda. And these kind of maps are uh, very important for uh, utilities. We also use GIS in hydrological modeling. First of all, GIS can be used as a separate tool where we uh, prepare the data for the model and uh, after modeling we post-process the data to get to our uh, visualizations that we need. And we can visualize uh, using a GIS and also in uh, space and in time. But sometimes uh, or often you also find integrated tools or plugins that take care of the whole uh, modeling uh, pre- and post-processing and the visualization. So what is this pre-processing that we need to do? Well, often we need to import or convert to the format that is uh, used by the GIS. So if we get data from sensors, uh, from uh, samples in the field, we need to uh, read it in a certain way that the GIS can use it. Often the data is uh, not in the right projection, so we need to uh, define or change or uh, reproject uh, the data. Also, uh, the area that is uh, uh, used for analysis uh, might be uh, too large, and we, then we need to subset it, means clipping it to a smaller area, or we need to uh, resample if it's a raster, which means that uh, we go from a uh, one resolution to another resolution and often data needs to be reconditioned and uh, corrected then we can geoprocess the data we can do all kinds of analysis using uh, processing geoprocessing functionality we can interpolate the data very important if you have uh, data for meteorological stations for example and uh, after all this uh, we can export the data to the format that is used by the tools so this, uh, when the GIS is used for the pre-processing and the output of the pre-processing goes into another tool like a hydrological model. GIS can also be used for uh, delineating the boundaries. So we can look at administrative boundaries such as the province, the country or the arrondissement as you see here. We can also look at natural boundaries such as uh, catchments or uh, subcatchments. And there are also more uh, human-defined uh, boundaries uh, that are less clear, such as a, a delta or a national park. So GIS can be used for uh, map production, very important output of GIS. For visualizations, so not only on the map, but also as we have seen in the 2.5D or 3D in animations or interactive uh, maps on websites. We can use it for uh, geoprocessing, for use in uh, tools. Uh, many of the GIS software come with a so-called toolbox with lots of geoprocessing functions. And we can use those functions to do geospatial analysis in general. Nowadays GIS doesn't run anymore on uh, big mainframes, but uh, we have a server these days uh, which uh, runs uh, a GIS engine and it can be used to serve all kinds of maps and, uh, and map products. We have a desktop where we can do our processing, although more and more is done online using the server uh, and web services. And we even run our GIS on uh, mobile devices and they connect to, uh, to a server for processing and for getting the, the data. So GIS is uh, used in many uh, platforms nowadays. But uh, in this course we focus on the GIS desktop applications where we use an application with a graphical user interface or a GUI. 
They consist of menus where we can make different choices such as loading uh, the layers or doing vector or raster analysis or opening the processing toolbox. Then there are toolbars with a lot of icons that are shortcuts to the different uh, tools. Then there's the um, layers panel where we can see all the map uh, layers and all these layers are in a certain order that uh, determines the visualization in the map canvas. So the map canvas is the place where the data of, of the layers of the map layers is visualized. And that builds our uh, GIS system. Desktop applications normally have two views. There's the map canvas where we visualize the analysis results and there's the print layout view where we can design our map for uh, printing, for example, or for a digital uh, document. And there we see a piece of paper where we can add different elements of a map such as uh, North Arrow, Legend, Scale Bar, Title, etc. Besides desktop applications, we also have command line applications. That's very useful for uh, testing and customizing GIS operations. And it is essential if you want to do uh, batch processing or make uh, spatial dynamic models, for example. Now there are nowadays a lot of tools. There are uh, open source and proprietary tools and they uh, are different in the way they work. So open source software uh, has community support. So there's not one company that you call to get support. There's no license cost. They are made to be interoperable. Uh, so you can always uh, switch to another tool and uh, combine results of different tools and integrate tools because it's based on open standards. And these standards determine how uh, different software modules com uh, communicate with each other and also with a server, for example, or with a sensor in the field. Because the code is open, it can be peer-reviewed. That means that everybody uh, who can read programming languages can check if the code of certain processing algorithms uh, is really doing what, uh, what the progr programmer intended to do. We also see with open source that uh, new developments are quicker implemented because the community develops the software and if there's a need in the community uh, it will be uh, implemented. And it, this doesn't mean that all these people work voluntarily. Uh, a lot of business is generated around the open source product and there are a lot of companies investing in, uh, in these tools. So if they want new features they can pay companies and uh, develop new feature. Uh, and of course, then the new feature uh, becomes available for the whole uh, community. On the other hand, there's the proprietary business model where all the commercial support is with one vendor, where uh, there is a license cost. There's a high risk of vendor lock-in, which means that you have to always buy products of the vendor um, to have a smooth uh, way of working because they don't uh, work a lot with uh, standards and have their own standards. So this locks you into one uh, company and they use protected formats so the, it's not easy to uh, to exchange the different formats and their code cannot be uh, peer-reviewed because it's closed and there's a slow implementation of uh, new features and uh, the features don't depend on uh, on the mass of users that want it but on priorities of the, the company or the people who pay most. For GIS, open source software uh, that is very popular is QGIS. Uh, there's also Saga, which is also included into QGIS in the processing toolbox. There's Ilvis and uh, GDAL, but there are many, many more uh, tools. And from the proprietary tools, there is, uh, of course, the well-known ESRI ArcGIS. There's uh, Idrisi from Clark Labs, and there are also several other ones. Most of the open source software is under the umbrella of the OSGeo, Open Source Geospatial Foundation. Apart from uh, dissemination of uh, open source uh, geo software, it's also involved in educational products and uh, dissemination of open data. 
on their website you can uh, see the different open source projects and uh, you can find uh, news from the community and the foundation and when their uh, FOS4G conferences are uh, organized so FOS free and open source software 4G for geography and uh, every year there's a big uh, international conference but there are also local chapters If you want to uh, try open source uh, geography GIS software, then uh, for Windows you have the choice of OSGO for W. It's an installer and you can choose a lot of different packages. And um, if you, without installing, want to try a lot of open source uh, GIS software, you can also try the OSGO Live, um, which can run as a virtual machine on your computer, so you don't have to really install all the software but you run the virtual machine that you can download for free from the internet and try uh, QGIS or Geonode or PostGIS and uh, then decide if uh, that's something you need. The most important open source GIS software, desktop software is uh, QGIS and uh, QGIS was invented by uh, Gary Sherman in 2002 and at that time uh, it was called Quantum GIS. In 2007 it became an incubator project of the OSGO Foundation and uh, after that a lot of developments happened. In 2009 the version 1.0 was released and in 2013 version 2.0 and now we're in uh, version 3.0 uh, with the latest version is uh, 3.6 at this moment of this recording and um, there are also long-term releases introduced since version 2.8. These long-term uh, releases are very important because they are uh, sustained until the new LTR version uh, comes available. So the current LTR is uh, version 3.4. That means for over a longer term um, the, this version uh, will be updated, will be uh, maintained and uh, for operational use we can advise to use the LTR versions and not the, the newest versions which are always good to try but um, the more the LTR versions are more stable so why are so many people using QGIS? first of all it's free as in lunch which means you can install and use it and it doesn't cost you anything there's no initial fee, no recurring fee, nothing but it is also free as in liberty which means that uh, if you need something to be made for QGIS you can uh, do something uh, yourself instead of hoping and waiting for the next release uh, so you can sponsor the development or if you're a developer you can edit yourself or program some uh, plugins for example that's also the reason why it's constantly developing because many people around the world are uh, improving the software and uh, it will uh, not stop. It's, uh, uh, it has a high critical mass and uh, many people are, uh, are developing new tools and uh, there's a good relation between users and developers. There's extensive help and documentation available and uh, yeah, most of the questions if you simply uh, ask them in your search engine, in your browser. There are many other people who uh, had the same problem and many other people who helped uh, people with problems uh, to solve them. So there's a lot of information found on uh, QGIS solutions on the internet. And what's also very important and contrary to proprietary uh, software is that it uh, supports different operating systems. So you can run it on the on the Mac or on Windows or Linux or Unix. There's even an Android version. How do you install QGIS? Well, you simply go to QGIS.org and uh, look for the download button and then choose your operating system. And if you want to use it for operational use, you choose then the long term release LTR uh, version you need to know if your laptop or uh, computer is 32-bit or 64-bit and uh, if you're a new user then uh, we can advise to use the standalone installer
The standalone Windows installer uh, installs QGIS completely with uh, Grass, Python and all the libraries uh, you need. And it also allows to do uh, updates and therefore you use the OS Geo4W um, installer that comes with it. So it's very easy to uninstall and reinstall the software and uh, keep the settings even when you want to upgrade. The OS Geo for W network installer always checks for the newest software uh, through the internet and it comes with a nice uh, wizard for Windows and uh, you don't need to be concerned about the dependencies so it's easy to update uh, the applications. When you use GIS you also hear a lot about uh, GDAL or GUDAL which is essentially a library to convert raster and vector formats. It takes into account not only the format change but also the changes in uh, projection that you want and uh, it stands for the geodata abstraction layer and it supports many many formats here are a few uh, like GeoTIFF, Erdos Imagine files or Esri shapefile or Google KML and the library is included in uh, different programming languages so you can also use the library in uh, Python, for example, to import uh, different file types and to use these files in, uh, in your scripts. It also comes with standalone utility programs and all these scripts and programs are also uh, linked, for example, in uh, QGIS. So you can... Uh, most of the functions in QGIS are based on, uh, on GDAL functions. So it's widely used in uh, both proprietary and open source software applications. And uh, we use uh, the term GDAL mostly for raster and OGR for vector. In GIS we also use nowadays a lot the Python programming language. That's a standard also for uh, both commercial and open source software in GIS. And that is because Python comes with a lot of geospatial analysis libraries that we can use to uh, manipulate raster or vector data or do time series analysis and we can even make spatial dynamic models with Python. And scripting is a very important skill so after learning uh, the basics of GIS you might want to uh, go to more advanced uh, skills such as scripting because that means you can do you can run things in batch for example if you need to convert 800 uh, satellite image products from HDF format to GeoTIFF and change at the same time the projection then it just requires a few line of code uh, and it will save you a lot of time and money uh, to do that And uh, uh, Python, you can also find it integrated into the GIS desktop software such as uh, ArcGIS and QGIS. So there are lots of tools and it's important to use a combination of tools because each tool has its advantages and disadvantages and uh, the only way to learn it is, uh, is practice. So you need to learn it uh, mostly on the job it doesn't help much to read uh, books or manuals about GIS or lecture notes. Watching these videos can help you a bit uh, to start, but uh, yeah, working on, uh, on the task yourself, uh, that's the best way. And internet is always there to, uh, to ask your questions, especially for the open source GIS. If you need to know something, just use the search engine in your browser. 